Are you ready? It's that time. It's everyone's favorite time of the week. It's everyone's favorite time of the day. It's time for this week's Parsha podcast. Coming to you from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. It's Parsha Slech Lecha. We are finally meeting our heroes. We're meeting Abraham and, and Sarah. We're hearing about Isaac. We're up to the story of our people, the story of our history. Let us begin. Now, before we begin, I have to let you know what happened. A miracle happened. Do you believe it? A miracle happened to all of us, to all the participants of the Parsha podcast family. We had a miracle this week, and this is what happened. As you know, these Parsha podcasts, we don't really have a team of writers or speech writers or ghost writers to do all the work, and I just come over here and be the on-air talent. That would be cool. If you want to apply to become a speech writer for the Parsha Podcast, send me an email, rabbojima.com. But that's not how it works. So how does it work? So I try to read the Parsha. I try to study the Parsha and try to figure out what's going on in the Parsha to look at my notes from previous years and study it and spend time and see what the Almighty says my way. So this year, I wanted to talk about Lot or Lot, the brother-in-law slash nephew of Abraham, And I decided, well, we're going to speak about him. I even had a clever line. I said, we have a lot to talk about. That was the plan to say. And I made a a list of 18 things that we know about Lot or Lot from our Parsha. To figure out who he is, you know, he ends up being the forbearer of Messiah. He's half Messiah, half Sodom and Gomorrah. And I was really working really hard. And it just wasn't clicking. I wasn't finding the right angle to penetrate the subject. And then something happened yesterday. That has never happened before. I got a call from my oldest brother, Eli, who lives in Israel. He actually has a yeshiva in northern Israel. It's an amazing person, one of the most special people in the world, someone who also helped me a lot in my life. And he started an amazing yeshiva in northern Israel. And each week, he delivers a discourse to his students. So he called me up yesterday and says, I want to discuss with you some ideas of what I'm thinking to speak about in my weekly discourse. Maybe you can help me clarify the subject. So he starts talking and he quotes the Talmud. And boom, it hit me like a ton of bricks. The Talmud is ready to our parsha. It dovetails perfectly with a very difficult Rashi that troubled me yesterday. And he unwittingly was helping me prepare for my podcast. What a miracle. He called me up. So I should help him to prepare his discourse. In the end, he helped me prepare this podcast as well. How do you like that? We're getting some help from the greater international Walby clan. Miracles are happening with the Parsha podcast. The Almighty is always on our side, facilitating our study and our learning and our growth and our transformation each week. So let's begin. So we're finally talking about Abraham and and Sarah, the patriarchs, the matriarchs. It's almost like we're we're home. We're in this cozy little place with our forebearers. And they undergo a stunning transformation in our Parsha. When we are first introduced to Sarah, she was then called Sarai. This is the end of last week's Parsha. She was barren. The verse says, this is 1130. She's barren. She doesn't have any children. In fact, the commentaries even add that she lacked the hardware, the anatomy of fertility. And over the course of our Parsha, this changes. They're renamed Abraham and Sarah. It's not Abraham, it's Abraham. It's not Sarai, it's Sarah. And they are foretold that they're going to have a son, and his name is going to be Isaac. And he, of course, is born in the end of next week's Parsha. So what changed? How did this old and barren couple... How are they transformed into being fertile? So we read something fascinating. Chapter 14 tells of the world war that Abraham participated in and he triumphed. And then chapter 15 begins, after these events happened, God appears to Abraham in a vision and he tells him, don't worry, Abraham, he's still called Abraham, I'm going to protect you. Your reward is vast and great. And Abraham complains to God, he said, what could you give me? I don't have any children. I am barren. The only person I have is Eliezer, my trustful servant. And if I have no children, all the goodness that you're giving to me, it's just going to end, so to speak. It's not going to continue. My line won't continue. And therefore, whatever you're giving me, it's only temporary. And God tells Abraham, 
No, you have it wrong. This guy, Eliezer, he's not going to inherit you. The one who emerges from your loins, i.e. your child, that will be your heir. And then verse 5, God takes Abraham outside and he tells him, gaze, look, heavenward, count the stars. Could you count the stars? You can't count the stars. Your children will be as innumerable as the stars. Amazing transformation. God promises Abraham, then called Abraham, that he's going to have an heir who will be his continuity. And he takes him outside and says, look at the heaven, count the stars. You can count the stars. So will be your children. So Rashi tells us something really interesting. This is the troublesome Rashi. What does it mean he took him outside? So Rashi gives three interpretations. The first one, he says, well, go outside. You want to look at the stars? Watson, you want to see the stars? You have to be outside of your tent. Abraham was inside the tent, or Abraham was inside the tent. And inside the tent, you can't see the stars. You got to go outside. That's a simple interpretation. Says Rashi, I'll give you also the Midrashic interpretation. What does it mean to go outside? It means to leave your itstagninus. What is your itstagninus? Leave your horoscope. Leave your astrology. Because you looked at your destiny in the stars, in the mazalos, in these cosmic forces, and you determined from what you saw, God says to Abram, that you're not going to have a son. And you know what? Abram won't have a son, but Abraham will. Sarai won't bear children, but Sarah, Sarah will. I'm going to change your name. And by dint of changing your name, I'm going to change your destiny and fate. And therefore, you will have a child. So this is the second interpretation. Rashi Rashi offers a third interpretation, but this is what I want to talk about. The second interpretation of Rashi, God says to go out and count the stars or look at the stars, gaze heavenward. What does it mean? Remove yourself from your current destiny that you saw in the stars. You're not going to have any children. We're going to change that, give you a new name and a new identity, and thereby you'll have a new destiny. What an amazing Rashi. Abraham looked in the stars. He was able to obviously perceive the messages of the stars. And it said that he will bear no children. And Sarai as well. She was then called Sarai. The stars determined, whatever that means, that they will remain barren. And God says, go out of your stars. Leave your astrology. Leave these cosmic influences. Not because it's a bunch of baloney. That's what I would have thought. It's nonsense. The stars know nothing. That's not what the Almighty says. It is indeed true. The stars accurately foretell that Abram is barren and Sarai is barren. But I'm going to find a workaround. I'm going to change your name. You're not Abram, who's barren. You're Abraham, who's fertile. She's not Sarai, who's barren. She is Sarah, Sarah. And by changing your name, we're going to change your astrological destiny and you will have children. What an exotic idea. Abraham, then called Abraham, is worried that he will not bear any children. He's able to see that in the stars. And the Almighty concedes that he's correct. But no worries. God doesn't promise to change the stars if you look at it. We're not going to change the status of Abraham. Abraham will forever remain barren. We're just going to change you. You are now Abraham. And you don't have that cosmic determination. Abraham and Sarah, Sarah, can indeed have children. What a fascinating idea that Rashi tells us. And of course, it raises all kinds of interesting and tantalizing questions. How exactly was Abraham able to gaze at the stars and to see what his destiny is? Where do I sign up for a course? You know, where's the course for Stargazing 101? But at a very basic level, the very notion of a destiny of a person being visible to the stargazers, that in itself is a great mystery. What does it mean? So 
it actually appears two more times in Rashi, Rashi's commentary to, to the Torah, from my account. Maybe there's more. I didn't actually Google this. But from my recollection, it appears twice more. Once in Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, the last verse in chapter 1 of Exodus. That's when Pharaoh instructs his whole nation that all new baby boys must be thrown into the water. Why did Pharaoh make that decree? So Rashi tells us that the day that Moses was born, Pharaoh's Itztagninov, i.e. his stargazers, they told him, today, the savior of Israel, the, the savior of the Jewish people, was born. But we don't know, is he an Egyptian? Is, is he an Israelite? But we can foresee in the stars that the destiny of this savior is that he will be stricken with water. So Pharaoh has a brilliant idea. Oh, the star years are telling me that this person, he's going to be stricken with water. I'll have all the new more boys thrown in the water. We'll kill them. We'll drown them before they could grow up to become a menace to save the Jewish people. And then Rashi concludes that the stargazers, they did not know exactly the nature of of the savior of the Jewish people's suffering at the hands of water. What actually happened is that Moses did save the Jewish people and Moses was stricken, was punished because of water when he hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock. That was Moshe's sin, so to speak, on his level, of course, in chapter 20 of Numbers. And that's why Moses was punished. They wasn't able to enter the land. And he died on the east bank of the Jordan because of water. And that was the mistake. They attributed the punishment of Moshe to something that they could solve. They would solve the problem by by just drowning all the babies. And ultimately, the hitting of the rock and the punishment that ensued, that was the actualization of that, so to speak, that message in the stars. In fact, if you look in numbers, in the aftermath of hitting of the rock, it says, Hema, May, Mariva, these are the quarrelsome waters. And Rashi does a classic callback. He says, this is the water that was featured earlier in chapter one of Exodus, where Pharaoh said the leader of the, the save the Jewish people is going to be stricken with water. And therefore they made the decree to throw, to cast all the babies into the water. So that's the other place that appears or the second place that appears. Exodus chapter one, verse 22. And then finally, in Exodus chapter 10, verse 10, this is before the plague of locust, where Pharaoh's opposition is softening, and he wants to send the Jewish people, but then he asks, who is going? And on verse 10, it says, he says, I'm not going to send all of you. Don't you see Reut, see ki ra'ah nega penechem. There is ra'ah, there is evil, there is bad, there is danger facing you. And again, Rashi tells us something very exotic. Umidrash Agada, the Midrash has the following interpretation. There is one star whose name is Ra'ah, i.e. evil. And Pharaoh says, I see, I see in my stargazers that this star is approaching you in the wilderness. And it is a symbol of blood and death. And therefore, Pharaoh is telling them it's a bad idea to leave Egypt because I can see the destiny of What's going to happen to you in the wilderness is this Ra'a character, this Ra'a star, and it means you'll all die. There will be a bloodbath, and therefore, you're better off staying here. And then Rashi gives us the postscript of that prediction. When the Jewish people sent the golden calf, they might have wanted to kill them, and Moshe prayed, Lama yomru meitzrayim lemor bira'a hotziyam. This is in chapter 32 of Exodus. Don't let Egypt have the victory lap that, oh, we were right. Our stargazers were right. Ra'a indeed destroyed them. They did die in a bloodbath. And the Almighty says, you know what? That's persuasive. And the Almighty changed. God changed, so to speak, the destiny foretold in Ra'a, in this message in the stars. And he switched the blood, not to be a bloodbath of the nation being destroyed, rather to be the blood of circumcision. When Joshua circumcised the nation, that is the blood that was foreseen ex post facto by Pharaoh. What an amazing idea here. 
that there is this ability of stargazing to be able to determine or to foresee the future. At least some aspects of our destiny and future are visible in the stars. And if we knew how to interpret them, we could see it as well. Maybe not so clearly. You know, there were some misinterpretations like the Egyptians. They thought that drowning the babies would solve their Moses problem. But there is a bit of the future that is already predetermined. And the stargazers have a window into it. In all three instances, it was at least to some degree somewhat accurate. Abraham and Sarai were indeed barren. Their names and identities were changed and therefore their destiny was changed. Moses indeed was punished over water. They just interpreted it wrong. The Jews had blood in their future. God changed it to the blood of circumcision. This concept is just fascinating. But I think it also raises some troubling questions. You know, Abraham or Abraham and Sarai had a destiny. And you would imagine that we too have a destiny foretold in the stars. But unlike us, Abraham has a divine intervention. The mind says, ah, don't worry about it. I'll just rename you. We have this divine renaming ceremony. You're no longer Abraham, and therefore you are no longer subject to Abraham's cosmic fate. How can we change our destiny? How can we alter our path, improve our path, when we don't have this verse, the amount of intervening, oh, let me take you out of the stars. Evidently, when there is a predetermined destiny, it is fixed. You can only work around it. Even Abraham needed God to intervene and change who he was. Are we doomed to be pigeonholed into whatever kind of reality is in store for us in the stars? It sounds really depressing. Are our innate nature and destiny limitations, are they all fixed and immutable and unchangeable? That was the question that was irking me yesterday. And I get a phone call. It's my brother Eli calling from Israel. And he wants to discuss a Talmud, which gave me the answer. Are you ready for this? At the very end of the entire Sea of Talmud, the third to last page of the last book, the book of Nida, by my counting, the 2709th page of Talmud, it tells us how to be rich, how to be wise, and how to have male sons. It waits until the very end to give us these secrets. Hey, you want to know how to be rich, how to be wise, how to have a nice family? Just read through the whole Talmud, and then three pages from the end... It'll give us this really interesting information. Unlike the Talmud, I'm going to tell you the information right now. I'm not going to force you to read the whole Talmud. I'm going to reveal to you what it says. Now, the context of this teaching of the Talmud is really interesting. There were 12 questions we are told that the wise men of Alexandria asked the great sage, Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanna, one of the teachers of Rabbi Ativa. Three of the questions related to behavior. And the first of those three questions, Ma ya'ase adam v'yachram. What should a person do and become a chacham, become wise? How do you raise your intellect? How do you become more intelligent? How do you become more wise? What did Rabbi Yoshua ben Hanania reply? Amr Lani responded to them, Yar Rabbi Yeshiva, spent a lot of time in Yeshiva and do only a little bit of commerce. Focus on study and deprioritize commerce, business. So they said to him, wait a minute, a lot of people tried this, it didn't work. Ella, rather, you should seek mercy, ask mercy from he who has all the wisdom. Quotes the verse, Ki Hashem yitain bipiv God gives wisdom from his mouth. Who gives wisdom? It comes from God. If it comes from God, you ask God for a little bit of his wisdom. Because an example, a king makes a big party and the things that are closest to him, he gives to his closest people. So too, wisdom is so close to the Almighty and he gives it from his mouth, so to speak, and not from any other treasure house. He gives it from his mouth, so to speak, to those that he loves. Now, Talmud asked the question, wait a minute. 
Rabbi Shua ben Hanani, you told us that it's prayer ask from he who has all the wisdom, but initially you told us something else. Initially you told us you should spend a lot of time in yeshiva, yarba vi yeshiva, and vi might v'schara, and do a little bit, not so much, minimize the amount of business. So if it's all about prayer, why did you tell me those other solutions to spend a lot of time in yeshiva, vi might v'schara, and minimize business? Says the Talmud, he responds, Deha Beloha Lo Sadi. This, without that, is insufficient. You need both. In order to indeed become wise, you need to put in the effort of Yarba of Yeshiva, do a lot of Yeshiva, and minimize Schora, minimize business, plus you have to seek mercy from he who has all the Wisdom, i.e., you have to pray to God. I actually had a dear friend of mine ask me this week, if Torah is so powerful, if Torah is so transformative, why do we need prayer? Here's the answer. Prayer is the precondition for getting the wisdom. Prayer is like the pipeline through which the heavenly wisdom gets filtered down. So here we go. We have, and how do you become wise? We have the formula. And by the way, it actually works. I actually know of an example that I saw myself that this actually happened. I was in a yeshiva and there was an individual there, a student, a fellow student, who was, I don't know how to say this properly, he was a bit slow. He just wasn't that intelligent. And he worked harder than anyone else in the building. And he prayed with greater intensity and devotion than everyone else. And many years later, I bumped into him and I couldn't believe what I saw. He had become a master scholar. He was spinning various parts of Talmud like a wizard. Not only that, he was in close communication with great Torah scholars about advanced, highly complex Talmudic subjects. He was writing them letters and correspondence. And I remember thinking, where did this come from? When I saw him last, he was way below average. He struggled even to just read the text. And he suddenly transformed into this titanic scholar, whipping out esoteric sources like a maestro. Here's the answer. The wisdom is all God's. And if you follow this three-pronged formula, you work hard, you spend a lot of time in yeshiva, you, you concentrate, and you don't do any things that could take away from that, and you seek mercy from he who has all the wisdom, he will give you the wisdom from his mouth. So here we go. That's the first thing that they asked Rabbi Yoshua, the wise men of Alexandria. The next question they asked is, how do you become wealthy? So he says you do a lot of business, a lot of commerce, and do business with integrity, be very honest. And they again said, well, a lot of people tried that. It didn't work. Rather, you should ask from he who has the gold and silver. God is all the money. God's the ultimate billionaire, trillionaire. And therefore, he has all the gold. You want some? You ask him. Well, if so, why do we need to do a lot of business? Why do we need to do business with integrity? This, without that, is insufficient. You have to have both. You have to do the effort on your own, both the positive effort of doing a lot of business and refraining from the negative effort, i.e. not to do something that can imperil that effort. Do business with integrity, and you do that, plus you pray. That's the magic formula. And finally, what does a person need to do to have male sons? He should marry a fitting wife, and should be modest in intimacy, and that will result in male sons. A lot of people tried that it didn't work out. Rather, you should ask for mercy. You should pray from he who has all the sons, quotes a verse. Well, why do you need to be told to marry a good wife, a fitting wife, and to be modest in intimacy? Because you need both. There we go. This is the teaching on the third last page of the Talmud. The book of Nida, page 70b, going into 71a. We have the authoritative guide for how to become rich, how to become wise, how to have male sons, as conveyed by Rabbi Yoshua to the wise men of Alexandria. By the way, the wise men of Alexandria did not ask what to do if you prefer daughters. Apparently for that, we don't have a prescription. Well, what if you prefer to not be wise? That wasn't part of their questions, but I don't know the answer. The answer is, Lots of television and lots of social media. Well, what about wealth? We know we've talked about this in the past. Tithing is also presented as a key to wealth. 
Why didn't Rabbi Yoshua tell this to the wise men of Alexandria? That's an interesting question. But regardless, we have this Talmud that talks about how to become rich, how to become wise, and how to have male sons. Now, this seems to be a motley mix of questions. So why specifically were these three things investigated? So there's an amazing Maharsha comment on this Talmud. He asked the question, well, why, why are these wise men of Alexandria, why are they asking about money and wisdom and male sons? What about uh, how do you become handsome or clever or charismatic? How to become affable? There's lots of other qualities out there. Why are these three the only ones that the wise men of Alexandria are asking Rabbi Yeshua? So he responds, or he answers, Marsha answers with an amazing idea. There are certain things that we are told in the literature are predetermined and they are fixed in stone before a person is even born. Quotes the Talmud early in the book of Nita, page 16b. There's an angel in charge of conception and the angel takes the drop, the primordial biological fluid, and brings it before God and says, will this drop, or the person that emerges from this drop, will they be wise or will they be foolish? Will they be rich or will they be poor? Some things, we're told, are predetermined. Your intellect, your wealth, it's not in your hands. Moreover, the book in Moed Cotton, page 28a, it tells us, Chaye Baneumazone, life, children, and nourishment, sustenance. That is not in your hands to influence, so to speak, with your merits. Ella It is determined in your mazel, in the stars, in the cosmic forces. It's not in your hands. It's predetermined, part of your mazel. The question that the wise men of Alexandria wanted to know is the same question that we want to know. What do you do if you have a fixed destiny? It's determined in the stars. It was determined before you were even born to be intelligent or to be a fool, to be rich, to be poor. What kind of children are you going to have? It's not in your hands. And that was the question. Is there any way to change your destiny? Is there any way to influence what happens in the stars? And Rabbi Yeshua responded, there is a formula. There's a way to change the decree. The decree that's set in stone can be altered and amended and changed. How do you do that? With a lot of hard work. With avoidance of things that would counteract that. And with prayer. What kind of prayer? Seeking mercy from he who has all the wealth, who has all the wisdom, who has the keys of procreation. You got to do both. That is the magic formula. Amazing idea. The wise men of Alexandria knew that the things that are actually in our hands, well, that's, of course, it's in our hands. Of course, we can influence that. But what about all the things that are predetermined? That was the question of the wise men of Alexandria. That's what, that's what they wanted to know. How do we change that? And here we go. We have a formula. What you should do, what you should not do, those two plus prayer. Wisdom. If it had already been determined that you will be born, not so sharp. That is your lot. That is your destiny. It seems unchangeable. But it is... With committed Torah study plus minimization of commerce and, you would imagine, other distractions plus prayer from he who has all the wisdom, that's the magic formula and your brain power will get augmented. Wealth. If it was predetermined that you'll just, you know, you'll scrape by. How do you change that? Same formula. Do commerce. Avoid dishonesty and beseech and seek Mercy from God. 
And same thing with male sons. Do the things that will lead to that outcome. Avoid the things that will imperil it and pray your heart out to God. Apparently, even the things that are part of our destiny, they're in our hands. Like Abraham, he and Sarah, Sarai, were born without the ability to procreate. They just did not have it. And the stars testified as much. But the mighty intervened and that was changed. Apparently, the Talmud tells us that it's possible in a whole host of areas that you may have thrown on your hands up to fate, the, the, the destiny, the horoscopes, the astrology, the stars, the karma, the cosmic forces are at play. You could still change it. There is a formula. And perhaps we can speculate, just take this a step further. If you examine the three ominous predictions of the stars of the Itztagninus in the Torah, and you study the mechanics of how it works, it seems to be slightly different. So, for example, the Egyptian stargazers, they foresaw that Moshe was going to be punished by water. So they threw everyone, all the babies into the water. But that was a total misfire. Actually, he was punished because he hit the rock instead of speaking to it. Pharaoh tried to dissuade the Jews from leaving because the stargazers saw blood. And that indeed would have been the destruction of the nation after the golden calf, had Moshe not prayed. And the mighty changed the blood to circumcision blood. And with Abraham, he was created as a new person. Now he's Abraham, not Abraham. And he's not subject at all to the decrees levied against Abraham. And now we have this Talmud that's offering this three-pronged approach of how to trump the stars, the nature, the determination, when the angel's holding the drop and asking God, what's going to be with this child? How exactly does that work? How does someone who was not naturally wise, but earned it with the three-pronged approach, study a lot of Torah, spend a lot of time yeshiva, don't do things that will detract from this, oh, and pray your heart out, how does this person overcome their nature? Perhaps we can speculate that the way it happens is exactly the way it happened to Abraham. Abraham was infertile, but Abraham's a new person. With this three-step process, you can be recreated anew and get a new identity. Abraham is not the only one, perhaps, who was able to get a name change. We can change the person that we are. The Talmud brings a verse, Hashem yitain chachma mipiv das sonar. God will give wisdom from his mouth. So, of course, what exactly this means, it's, it's uh, theologically something to tiptoe around. But the wisdom we're told comes from, so to speak, God's mouth to our mouth. This strongly resembles the blowing of the soul into man's nostrils. God, perhaps, when he's giving us wisdom, He's not changing our destiny. He's changing our identity. He's going to give us, so to speak, a new soul from his mouth, a new identity. And this process will mirror turning Abraham into Abraham. Hard work plus avoiding the pitfalls plus prayer, requesting mercy. That's an appeal for a name change and an identity change. Yes, the earlier version of you, the other guy, that guy was a fool. He was slow, dim-witted, whatever the correct non-offensive term for someone who has more limited mental capacities. But Rabbi Yeshua revealed to the wise men of Alexandria that there's a way to sidestep this designation. You get a new identity. And that new identity does not have those limitations. Maybe we can even suggest, you know, this appears, this advice appears at the very end of the Talmud. I propose maybe we should have it on page one. Don't you need to be wise to study Talmud? Perhaps this cannot be told to us at the very beginning of the Talmud. If you've done nearly all of Talmud, you have three pages left, maybe then you've put in enough work to claim that you have spent enough time in yeshiva. If it was in the first 10 pages, people say, you know what? I did all this hard work already. I studied Torah for three hours. Where is my genius mega brain intellect package upgrade happening? You have to work really, really hard to get this. And you have to be vigilant to not do anything that would counteract that. 
and you need to pray. Not to recite cryptic passages in a foreign language. That's not prayer. To seek mercy from he who has everything that you want. It has to be genuine and sincere and heartfelt. That is the formula to get what Abraham got. We all have limitations. We all have natural impediments. We all have parts of our destiny, our astrology, what the angel determined about us or was determined via the angel about us before we were born, what it says in the stars about us. There's all kinds of limitations. And I want to study, I want to learn, I want to understand, I want to have the strength, I want to have the life, I want to have the wisdom, I want to have the fortitude, but I don't have it in me. It's violating my innate nature. I want the wealth, I want the male sons, I want children in general, I want the long, healthy, robust life. And it's just not in the cards. Abraham had the same problem. God solved it by changing Abraham into Abraham. And you too can change your destiny. I had a chat with a dear friend of mine this week, also a long time and enthusiastic listener of the Parsha podcast. And we're chatting with something else entirely, but I mentioned to him that I'm considering to get a piano for my daughter. And I said, well, you know, we're Walbies. We're like more masters of the spoken word. We're not so musically inclined or gifted. And he told me, he says, wait a minute, hey, Rabbi Walby, what are you saying? That's not how it works. You should know that's not how it works. You could change. Of course, he's 100% correct. There is almost nothing that you cannot get. We have the formula. The formula that was told, the secret that was told at the very end of the pages of the Talmud. The formula was revealed to the wise men of Alexandria and then written down for us all the way at the end. Hard work. Really hard work. Plus, not doing something that will inhibit the blessing and the flow. Plus, prayer, that is the formula for getting even the things that were not allocated to you naturally. If I work hard enough, I'm getting it. And I avoid the things that detract from it. And I pray, you follow that three-pronged formula. There's almost nothing that you cannot unlock. Perhaps it may amount to you getting a new identity a new soul, to some degree, you could have that blown into you, you can undergo a name change. I want to give one little caveat. It seems from the Talmud, and this is actually spoken out by Rav Dessler, that there is a concept called a higher destiny versus a lower destiny. If it is your mission, for example, to struggle with something, that's why you were put on this earth. You were put on this earth to struggle with poverty, let's say, for example, God forbid. If that is something which is your mission, it's essential to why you exist. Something like that indeed is unchangeable. So apparently, just just I don't want to be inaccurate in what we said over here. Apparently, the way it actually works is that almost everything is within reach, is accessible, even if it violates your mazel, what's predetermined for you, unless that is actually your mission. If it is your mission to struggle with something, and that's the reason why you exist, raison d'être, as they say in French, if that's why you exist, then you will not be able to alter it. No matter what you do, you can pray Your entire life, and if that's just your mission, that is what you are here. You cannot have that changed. But all the other things that are not actually our mission, just ancillary things that are part of our destiny and fate, those indeed are eminently changeable. Okay, let's hit this week's exotic insight. still called the exotic insight. I had some emails about this. People said, "Eh, Rabbi, you can still call it exotic insight. So we'll keep that name for now. If we have to amend the name of this amazing segment, of this exquisite segment at the end of the show, then we will let everyone know. So our parsha begins with an odyssey. Abraham is told, Lach lecha, leave, leave your homeland, leave your birthplace, leave your family, and travel. And Abraham, of course, obeys. He takes Sarai, his wife, 
He takes Lot, his nephew, and he takes all his possessions. Ve'es ha-nefesh asher asu b'charon. And he takes the souls that they made in Haran, the previous place that they went to, that they were living in, in the end of Parshas Noach. Ve'yetzu lo'lechaz ar t'kanon, ve'yavo ar t'kanon. They left towards the land of Canaan, and they arrived in the land of Canaan. That is the fifth verse of our Parsha. But what does it mean, the souls that they made in Haran? So Rashi offers us two explanations. Number one, the souls that they made in Haran refer to the people that they converted. Abraham, or Abraham and Sarai, well, they were evangelists. They were spreading the word of God. And they started a following. They started a movement. And those people were so committed to Abraham and his mission, to Abraham and his mission, and to Sarai, that they actually said, you're going, we're coming with you. And Rashi even says that Abraham, he would teach the men, and Sarah, Sarai, or Sarai at the time, she would teach the woman, and they developed a group of adherents, and those people are like the souls that they made, because when you teach someone to or you make them. That's what Rashi says. The first interpretation, second interpretation, Rashi says the simple interpretation is, well, these are the servants, the maid servants, the female servants, the, 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 the people of the household, and they joined with them in the journey. There is an amazing and exquisite Kabbalistic interpretation. It's a little bit mind-blowing. And as we know, we always admit this. We don't really know much about Kabbalah, but I saw this. I said, it's so interesting. I want to share it in this week's exotic and exquisite and amazing insight at the end of the show. So when we are introduced to Sarah, she's called Sarai, and in the last week's Parsha, verse 30 of chapter 11, the verse says, Vati Sarai Akara. She was barren. And then it adds three more words, Ain la vala, she has no children. So the Zohar asks a question. Wait a minute. We're told that she is barren. I know for sure she has no children. That is redundant. So why does it say she was barren? Oh, and also on top of that, she had no children. Says the Zohar. When it says she has no children, that means she has no physical children, but she does have spiritual children. Whenever Abraham and Sarai, whenever they united in intimacy, they did not procreate physical children, but they procreated spiritual children. They created souls, the souls that they made in Haran. And those souls, we're told, are the souls of converts. And when they traveled with them to Israel, they brought those souls, the souls that they made in Haran, they came with them to the land of Canaan. An amazing idea here. Sarah was physically infertile, but spiritually she was very fertile. They had no children, but their relationship spawned souls that were later claimed or redeemed by all future converts. And by the way, converts are called the children of Abraham and Sarah. This means quite literally, they have the souls, thanks to the procreation of Abraham and Sarah before they were made physically fertile. To me, this certainly qualifies as an exquisite insight. To me, it's a little bit mind-blowing as well. The only difference between converts and biological Jews, vis-a-vis their relationship to Abraham and Sarah, both get souls from the family of Abraham. The question is, if they also are related biologically to Abraham and Sarah or not. What an amazing insight. Really powerful. Really fascinating. Really intriguing. The nefesh, the soul that they made in Haran, they made souls in Haran. They didn't make any babies or any living souls, but they made souls that came alive eventually in the lives of converts. Really interesting. It seems like there's a lot more to say about this, but we will leave it here 
from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. This is the Parsha Podcast. My name is Yaakov Wolby. Send me an email. Rabbi Wolby at gmail.com. Have an amazing rest of your day. A fabulous and splendid and terrific and exquisite and incredible Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with help of the money, we'll talk again next week.